Today is day five for the Come Follow Me study for this week, May 20th through the 26th. We have entered into a covenant with him, Mosiah 18 through 24. Friday, May 24th, 2024, Mosiah 23. I will now read the account of the people of Alma. He testifies of our iniquities. Now, after hearing the words of the prophet, Alma believed the words which Abinadi had spoken. Cast him out! We should listen to this man! He speaks the truth! Slay him! But he fled before them and hid himself. And did write all the words that Abinadi had spoken. Alma began to teach the words of Abinadi. He warned us to repent. Here are the waters of Mormon. And as many as did believe him did go forth to a place which was called Mormon. And they were baptized in the waters of Mormon and were filled with the grace of God. And they were called the Church of God or the Church of Christ from that time forward. An account of Alma and the people of the Lord who were driven into the wilderness by the people of King Noah comprising chapters 23 and 24. Mosiah chapters 23 and 24 is a flashback within a flashback. The history of Alma from the time they were driven into the wilderness by the people of King Noah until they arrived in Zarahemla was added to the record. This small flashback occupies approximately 20 years. When the reader finishes chapters 23 through 24, both Zenith's people and Alma's people have returned to Zarahemla and King Mosiah. Chapter 23, Alma refuses to be king. He serves as high priest. The Lord chastens his people, and the Lamanites conquer the land of Helam. Amulon, leader of King Noah's wicked priest, rules subject to the Lamanite monarch. About 145 to 121 BC. This section of study tells how Alma and his people were taken captive by the Lamanites and placed under the authority of the wicked priests of the dead King Noah. Although God did soften the hearts of the Lamanites, he did not deliver Alma and his people from their captors for a time. What reason could the Lord have had in permitting a righteous group to suffer? What further purposes could he have had in mind in permitting Alma and his brethren to come under the control of men who were not keepers of his commandments? In Isaiah 55, 8-11, we are told that God's ways are not man's ways. In his perfect wisdom, there are certainly important reasons— for this further testing of the faith of Alma's people and in following the wicked priests to further demonstrate their wickedness. Alma warns of monarchical government, Mosiah 23, 1-2. Now Alma, having been warned of the Lord that the armies of King Noah would come upon them, and having made it known to his people, therefore they gathered together their flocks and took of their grain and departed into the wilderness before the armies of King Noah. And the Lord did strengthen them, that the people of King Noah could not overtake them to destroy them. Isaiah 40, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount upon the wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Mosiah 23, 3-7 And they fled eight days' journey into the wilderness. And they came to a land, yea, even a very beautiful and pleasant land, a land of pure water. And they pitched their tents and began to till the ground and began to build buildings. Yea, they were industrious and did labor exceedingly. And the people were desirous that Alma should be their king, for he was beloved by the people. But he said unto them, Behold, it is not expedient that we should have a king. For thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not esteem one flesh above another, or one man shall not think himself above another. Doctrine and Covenants 38. Let every man esteem his brother as himself, and practice virtue and holiness before me. Mosiah 23, 7 continued, Therefore I say unto you, it is not expedient that ye should have a king. Elder Erastus Snow said, In all ages, when the people of God listened to the voice and counsel of apostles and prophets, they enjoyed the blessings growing out of human freedom, and the tyranny and oppression of kings and rulers was impossible. There never was a kingly power placed over ancient Israel except against the remonstrance of the prophets.
Mosiah 23, 8 through 11. Nevertheless, if it were possible that ye could always have just men to be your kings, it would be well for you to have a king. But remember the iniquity of King Noah and his priests, and I myself was caught in a snare, and did many things which were abominable in the sight of the Lord, which caused me sore repentance. Nevertheless, after much tribulation, the Lord did hear my cries and did answer my prayers, and has made me an instrument in his hands in bringing so many of you to a knowledge of his truth. Nevertheless, in this I do not glory, for I am unworthy to glory of myself. Doctrine and Covenants 3. For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. Alma 26. Yea, I know that I am nothing. As to my strength, I am weak. Therefore, I will not boast of myself. But I will boast of my God, for in his strength I can do all things. Yea, behold, many mighty miracles we have wrought in this land, for which we will praise his name forever. Mosiah 23, 12-13 And now I say unto you, Ye have been oppressed by King Noah, and have been in bondage to him and his priests, and have been brought into iniquity by them. Therefore ye were bound with the bounds of iniquity. And now as ye have been delivered by the power of God out of these bonds, Yea, even out of the hands of King Noah and his people, and also from the bonds of iniquity. Even so, I desire that ye should stand fast in this liberty, wherewith ye have been made free, and that ye trust no man to be a king over you. Galatians 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The Necessity of Righteous Teachers Verse 14 teaches an important principle that all saints should do well to remember. There are times when, as students in schools, one must sit before teachers who are not men of God. Sometimes one cannot refuse to stay in such classes, for the circumstances are such that there is no other option. But when one has a knowledge of the gospel, he can weigh what is being taught and compare it to those standards found in the scriptures and in the Council of Living Prophets. Thus, he can demonstrate for himself what is true and whether those who are not men of God, while they may formerly be one's teachers, are teaching that which is not true. Mosiah 23.14 And also trust no one to be your teacher nor your minister, except he be a man of God, walking in his ways and keeping his commandments. Matthew 18 Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. The command to love one another, Mosiah 23:15. Thus did Alma teach his people that every man should love his neighbor as himself, that there should be no contention among them. John 13, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The Necessity of Order and Authority Mosiah 23, 16-17 And now Alma was their high priest, he being the founder of their church. And it came to pass that none received authority to preach or to teach, except it were by him from God. Therefore he consecrated all their priests and all their teachers, and none were consecrated except they were just men. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Book of Mormon Prophets gave the title priest to officers known in this dispensation as high priests. That is, they were priests of the Melchizedek priesthood. Since there was no Aaronic priesthood among the Nephites in Alma's day, there being none of the lineage empowered in pre-Meridian times to hold that priesthood, there was no need to distinguish between priests of the lesser and greater priesthoods. Similarly, there being no lesser priesthood in Abraham's day, Melchizedek, who held the greater priesthood, and in whose name it has ever therefore been called, was identified as the priest of the Most High God. David prophesied similarly of the priesthood which our Lord would hold, saying, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Mosiah 23.18 Therefore they did watch over their people and did nourish them with things pertaining to righteousness. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said, The primary purpose in this ministering idea will be, as was said of the people in Alma's day, to watch over their people and nourish them with things pertaining to righteousness. With these adjustments, we want more care and concern, not less. Call, visit, or write a letter to a church priesthood leader, teacher, or advisor 
who has nourished you with things pertaining to righteousness, and express your appreciation and testimony to him or her. The Lord tries the patience and faith of his people. Mosiah 23, 19-20 And it came to pass that they began to prosper exceedingly in the land, and they called the land Helam. And it came to pass that they did multiply and prosper exceedingly in the land of Helam. And they built a city, which they called the city of Helam. Even though they had repented of their sins, Alma and his people still found themselves in bondage. Their experience shows that trusting the Lord and living our covenants doesn't always take away our challenges, but it does help us overcome them. As you read Mosiah 23, 21-24, and 24, 8-17, note words and phrases that can help you learn to trust in the Lord, regardless of your circumstances. Mosiah 23, 21, Nevertheless, the Lord seeth fit to chasten his people, yea, he trieth their patience and their faith. Elder Lynn G. Robbins of the Seventy explained, The word chasten comes from the Latin castus, meaning chaste or pure and chasten means to purify. President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency shared counsel that can help us as we experience trials. You might reasonably wonder why a loving and all-powerful God allows our mortal tests to be so hard. It is because he knows that we must grow in spiritual cleanliness and stature to be able to live in his presence in families forever. To make that possible, Heavenly Father gave us a Savior and the power to choose for ourselves by faith to keep His commandments and to repent and so come unto Him. When you wonder how much pain you can endure well, remember Him. He suffered what you suffer so that He will know how to lift you up. He may not remove the burden, but He will give you strength, comfort, and hope. He knows the way. He drank the bitter cup. He endured the suffering of all. Even though the people who followed Alma had repented and been faithful, the Lord allowed them to be temporarily oppressed by the Lamanites, in fulfillment of a Benedite's prophecy and as a trial of their patience and faith. Elder Orson F. Whitney of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that everything we experience teaches us valuable lessons. No pain that we suffer, no trial that we experience is wasted. It ministers to our education to the development of such qualities as patience, faith, fortitude, and humility. All that we suffer and all that we endure, especially when we endure it patiently, builds up our characters, purifies our hearts, expands our souls, and makes us more tender and charitable, more worthy to be called the children of God. And it is through sorrow and suffering, toil and tribulation that we gain the education that we come here to acquire and which will make us more like our Father and Mother in Heaven. Elder Neil A. Maxwell gave the following insight about patience. The necessity of having this intriguing attribute is cited several times in the scriptures, including by King Benjamin, who clustered the attributes of a saint, and patience was a charter member of that cluster. Patience is not indifference. Actually, it is caring very much, but being willing, nevertheless, to submit both to the Lord and to what the scriptures call the process of time. Patience is tied very closely to faith in our Heavenly Father. Actually, when we are unduly impatient, we are suggesting that we know what is best, better than does God. Or at least, we are asserting that our timetable is better than His. Either way, we are questioning the reality of God's omniscience. As if, as some seem to believe, God were on some sort of postdoctoral fellowship. We read in Mosiah about how the Lord simultaneously tries the patience of His people, even as He tries their faith. One is not only to endure, but to endure well and gracefully those things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon us, just as did a group of ancient American saints who were bearing unusual burdens, but who submitted cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. The Lord has twice said, And seek the face of the Lord always, that in patience ye may possess your souls, and ye shall have eternal life. Could it be that only when our self-control has become total do we come into true possession of our own souls? Elder Neil L. Maxwell said, Faith includes faith in God's developmental purposes. For the Lord seeth fit to chasten his people, yea, he trieth their patience and their faith. Still, some of us have trouble when God's tutoring is applied to us. 
we plead for exception more than we do for sanctification. Elder Neil A. Maxwell also said, this wintry verse instructs and reminds us of one of the most central and regular challenges for the men and women of Christ. Such declarations of divine purpose ought to keep us on spiritual alert as to life's purposeful adversities, especially as we seek to become more saintly. Disciples will escape neither adversity nor the irony forming the hard crust of the bread of adversity. Irony tries both our faith and our patience. Irony can be a particular bitter form of chastening because it involves distributing incongruity. It involves outcomes in violation of our expectations, including what we feel we deserved. Sometimes it lays waste our good intentioned and best laid plans. On occasion, we even set up our own ironies by being too declarative and too certain. Such was the case with Peter, who said he would never deny Jesus. Peter was quickly reminded by the Savior that soon, before the rooster crowed, Peter would deny him three times. In like manner today, our rigidities and deficiencies sometimes may actually invite tutoring. With its inverting of the anticipated consequences, irony becomes the frequent cause of an individual's being offended. The larger and the more untamed a person's ego, the greater the likelihood of his being offended, especially when tasting his portion of vinegar and gall. Words may issue, why me? Why this? Why now? It is hoped such words will give way to subsequent spiritual composure, but when such words precede bitter inconsolability, then it is a surprisingly short distance to bitterness. Amid life's varied ironies, we may begin to wonder, didn't God notice this torturous turn of events? And if he noticed, why did he permit it? Am I not valued? Didn't I deserve better? Our pleading usually assumes that our destiny is largely in our own hands. Then come intruding events, first elbowing aside, then evicting what we had anticipated and even earned. Hence, we can be offended by events as well as by people. Irony may involve not only unexpected suffering, but also undeserved suffering. We feel we deserved better, and yet we fared worse. We had other plans, even commendable plans. Did they not count? For example, a physician who trained laboriously to help the sick cannot do so now because of his own illness. For a period, because of constraining circumstances, a diligent prophet of the Lord was an idle witness. Frustrating conditions keep more than a few of us from making our appointed rounds. Customized challenges are thus added to that affliction and temptation that Paul described as common to man. Doctrine and Covenants 136 My people must be tried in all things, that they may be prepared to receive the glory that I have for them, even the glory of Zion. And he that will not bear chastisement is not worthy of my kingdom. Doctrine and Covenants 95 Whom I love, I also chasten, that their sins may be forgiven. For with the chastisement I prepare a way for their deliverance. Mosiah 23, 22-28 Nevertheless, whosoever putteth his trust in him, the same shall be lifted up at the last day. Yea, and thus it was with his people. For behold, I will show unto you that they were brought into bondage, and none could deliver them but the Lord their God, yea, even the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And it came to pass that he did deliver them, and he did show forth his mighty power unto them, and great were their rejoicings. For behold, it came to pass that while they were in the land of Helam, yea, in the city of Helam, while tilling the land round about, behold, an army of the Lamanites was in the borders of the land. Now it came to pass that the brethren of Alma fled from their fields, and gathered themselves together in the city of Helam, and they were much frightened because of the appearance of the Lamanites. But Alma went forth and stood among them, and exhorted them that they should not be frightened, but that they should remember the Lord their God, and he would deliver them. Therefore they hushed their fears, and began to cry unto the Lord that he would soften the hearts of the Lamanites, that they would spare them and their wives and their children. Elder David A. Bednar said, Notice Alma did not hush the people's fears. Rather, Alma counseled the believers to remember the Lord and the deliverance only he could bestow. And knowledge of the Savior's protecting watch care enabled the people to hush their own fears. Correct knowledge of and faith in the Lord empower us to hush our fears because Jesus Christ is the only source of enduring peace. Mosiah 23, 29-39 
And it came to pass that the Lord did soften the hearts of the Lamanites. And Alma and his brethren went forth and delivered themselves up into their hands. And the Lamanites took possession of the land of Helam. Now the armies of the Lamanites, which had followed after the people of King Limhi, had been lost in the wilderness for many days. And behold, they had found those priests of King Noah in a place which they called Amulon. And they had begun to possess the land of Amulon. And they had begun to possess the land of Amulon and had begun to till the ground. Now the name of the leader of those priests was Amulon. And it came to pass that Amulon did plead with the Lamanites, and he also sent forth their wives, who were the daughters of the Lamanites, to plead with their brethren that they should not destroy their husbands. And the Lamanites had compassion on Amulon and his brethren, and did not destroy them because of their wives. And Amulon and his brethren did join the Lamanites, and they were traveling in the wilderness in search of the land of Nephi, when they discovered the land of Helam, which was possessed by Alma and his brethren. And it came to pass that the Lamanites promised unto Alma and his brethren that if they would show them the way which led to the land of Nephi, that they would grant unto them their lives and their liberty. But after Alma had shown them the way that led to the land of Nephi, the Lamanites would not keep their promise. But they set guards round about the land of Helam over Alma and his brethren. And the remainder of them went to the land of Nephi, and a part of them returned to the land of Helam, and also brought with them the wives and the children of the guards who had been left in the land. And the king of the Lamanites had granted unto Amulon that he should be a king and a ruler over his people, who were in the land of Helam. Nevertheless, he should have no power to do anything contrary to the will of the king of the Lamanites. Alma, having been warned of the Lord that the armies of King Noah would come upon them, departed into the wilderness. And the Lord did strengthen them, that King Noah could not overtake them to destroy them. They fled eight days into the wilderness, and they pitched their tents, and began to till the ground, and began to build buildings. Yea, they were industrious, and did labor exceedingly. Let us make Alma our king. It is not expedient that we should have a king. For thus saith the Lord, you shall not esteem one flesh above another, or one man shall not think himself above another. Every man should love his neighbor as himself, that there should be no contention among you. And watch over one another, and nourish one another with things pertaining to righteousness. And they began to prosper exceedingly in the land. Nevertheless, the Lord seeth fit to chasten his people, Yea, he trieth their patience and their faith. While they were tilling the land, an army of the Lamanites was in the borders of the land. The Lamanites are coming! Do not be frightened! Remember the Lord our God and he will deliver us. Soften the hearts of the Lamanites, that they spare us, and our wives, and our children. We do not desire any conflict, only peace. We have been lost in the wilderness for many days. If you show us the way which leads to the land of Nephi, we will grant unto you your lives and your freedom. Go in this direction for eight days, and you will reach the land of Nephi. Set guards round about the land! also brought with them the wives and the children of the guards who had been left in the land. Read this. The king of the Lamanites 
has granted unto Amulon that he should be a king and a ruler over this people. And his brethren have been appointed teachers over this people.